Well, folks, we've got a, a pretty substantial crowd starting in, so I'm going to get going. I know other people will join us as we go along. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm Peter Tabins, the MPP for Toronto Danforth. We'll start with the land acknowledgement, uh, follow with a more proper introduction of our panelists, a review of the agenda and some business items. Uh, the land acknowledgement we use is the one that has been put together by the Toronto District School Board. We acknowledge we're hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. Tonight will not be primarily focused on detailed points about board policies, but hoping to make sure we can set a common direction for dealing with the provincial government, which is shaping this whole return to school. Uh, joining me this evening, as I said earlier, our TDSB trustee, Jennifer Story, who's represented our community at the board for six years now and has been deeply involved in preparations for this fall. I've asked Jennifer to talk about the difficulties in developing a plan with the provincial government and address many of the questions that you've brought forward. Also joining me is Mart Stiles, official opposition critic for education, the MPP for Davenport Riding. Mart was elected to the legislature in 2018 and was previously the TDSP trustee for the Davenport community. She's been education critic for the past two years. And I also just want to note uh, that I've gotten an email. Councillor Paula Fletcher is in attendance uh, and just following these proceedings, she has a great interest in it. This is probably the first of a few sessions on the return to the board. I don't think it's going to be a quiet time. And so I'll be looking to expand to other guests for future sessions, depending on how things develop in the education system. Our agenda is very simple this evening. I'll be the moderator. We'll have Jen Story speak for up to 10 minutes, followed by Marit speaking for up to 10 minutes. Uh, this Zoom program allows me to do a survey of the audience as we go through the meeting. And so we'll have a number of questions that we'll be putting to you directly. After Mart and Jennifer have spoken, I'll present the results of the survey that almost 2,000 of you responded to, and I'm sure people will be interested in those results. We'll then go to a question, comment, and answer session for most of the evening with a wrap up just around 8.30 p.m. So please ask your questions by typing them on the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. I know right now that you won't, we won't be able to answer all of them. Uh, but we'll try to get to as many as we can. Where we haven't been able to get to questions, we'll send out responses by email, trying to answer those that need a fuller response. And I know Jennifer is very happy to respond directly to more detailed questions. If you send your email address to us at tabinsp-co at ndp.on.ca, we can get a response to you. Uh, staff from my office, will be helping to receive, answer, and follow up your questions as the meeting goes on. Uh, my staff will also be reviewing your questions that will be provided to the panelists. We'll be looking for ones that apply to the most people and posing them to the panelists. We won't be able to get into questions about individual board policies, for instance, the Toronto Catholic District School Board, uh, but as much as possible talking about the common challenges faced by the boards. I wanna say this before the panelists speak, that my team has been receiving just a torrent of phone calls and emails with people expressing their anxieties and worries about this school year. And I've followed this issue since the spring. It's been clear to me the return to school was gonna be one of the most difficult tasks that our society was gonna be taking on. The issues we're dealing with aren't minor. We're talking about the future and the safety of our children. We're talking about the containment of the pandemic. We're talking about a safe working environment for education workers, relief for parents who've been hard pressed for months, months. Uh, all of those on their own would be substantial, but they're all rolled together. And so we have a major event in this society. It's also been clear from my perspective that without action and investment by the provincial government, we can't actually get what we need to address those issues. They control the money, they control the legal framework, and we operate within that and where that framework and the funds fall short, it's not possible to do what's needed to be done in our schools. So tonight, we hope to learn from you and your comments and questions. Uh, we hope to give you a clear picture of what's going on and hopefully together by the end of this, we'll have a clearer sense of how to press the provincial government to solve the problems that we're facing. Uh, I know from other meetings 
that these meetings, other meetings about education, that these ones can be very emotional and people can be frustrated if they can't get their questions answered or their comments responded to. In order to keep things orderly, there are just a few ground rules. As I said before, please pose your questions using the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. And that those will be monitored uh, by my staff. Uh, I've been unfortunately aware that some Zoom meetings have been hijacked by people posting racist, sexist, or abusive comments, or attendees who are making nasty comments about others. We're monitoring and we will block people who do that. I need to emphasize that doesn't mean if you disagree with me or with the panelists that you will be blocked. Disagreement is critical to finding out what the truth of a situation is. So if you disagree with us, that's great. Just, you know, put it forward. What we're concerned about is those who are abusive, they will be blocked. So uh, before we go to trustee's story, um, we have our first survey question to get a sense of who's actually attending this evening. And I just like to ask, uh, Rob from my staff who's managing this evening to put up that first survey question. So I think you should be able to see it at this point, who's attending this evening. Uh, you have multiple choice. Uh, if you could fill that out in the next few seconds and then we'll get the results and Jennifer will read them out. Okay. Jennifer, I'm assuming that you can see the results. I can't, no. Okay. Unfortunately. I, I want to so, say to all of you who are watching this evening, we're learning how to do large Zoom meetings, but we're not yet perfect. We're working on that. Um, so I can. Rob, if you could read out the results, that would be useful. So Peter's poll uh, number one, um, who's attending the meeting? It uh, was clearly multiple choice. Parents with children uh, from kindergarten to grade three, 40%. Parents with children in grades four to eight, 33%. Parents with children in secondary school, 23%. Uh, educators, 27%. Students, 2%, and concerned community members, 31%. That's great. Yeah, a pretty diverse group. A pretty diverse group. Thank you very much for that, Rob. And with that, Jennifer, if I could turn things over to you. Thank you, Peter. Um, so uh, I want to thank, uh, thank you, Peter, and your whole team for setting up this uh, event tonight. And thanks um, to everyone who's joining us tonight. This has been uh, the topic that everyone uh, is talking about right now for so, so many very important reasons. So I'm happy to be here to talk about where we're at, how we got here, and where we need to go. I think most importantly, where we need to go. I think Marit's really going to, to, to bring those, those uh, questions home for us later. Um, class size, class size, class size. Everyone wants to talk about class size. Uh, we will talk about this tonight um, and, and the many issues that are related to that. Um, because what we're really all wanting is to make sure that our students, our kids, uh, our family members, our neighbors are safe, social, and learning when they go back to school. Um, some have already started going back in the TDSB. It's next week. Um, so I'm going to answer the questions around class size. Some of you submitted many ahead of time. Um, I'm going to talk about that issue. It's going to be woven in throughout what I want to cover tonight, and I'm sure it will also dominate the Q&A. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, uh, great detail and many of the uh, planning pieces. I know you have a lot of questions uh, about everything from 
you know, illness protocols, uh, vaccinations, et cetera. And I'm happy to uh, work offline with any of you if I can't answer your questions tonight um, through, through my next 10 minutes. So I'm gonna race ahead, uh, try to cover a bunch of stuff really quickly um, to try and paint a picture for everybody of, of the circumstances that we're in right now and, um, and lay the stage for what Mara wants to talk to us about. So um, let's cast our memories back, if you will, to last fall and last winter. Uh, you may remember, many of you were probably wearing them because I know a lot of you are educators, um, buttons that said class size matters uh, or no cuts to education. Well, I don't think we could be seeing right now a more stark demonstration of why um, those messages mattered so much as we were um, supporting our education, educators on rotating strikes and negotiations were dragging on. Next thing we know, we're in the, the week before March break. I remember clearly it was Friday the 13th, a pretty ominous day that um, we all realized that schools weren't going back, that workplaces were shutting down, and that even though we were told it was going to be two weeks following March break, we kind of all knew where the shoe started, shoe started to drop that it probably wasn't going to just be three weeks. And here we are, um, schools are just starting to go back. And the reason I take us back to that point is because um, that's when the planning started, right? In May, when the minister finally said, yes, the school year is not going to um, resume in person in the building. And that, that should have been a bit of a bellwether for us that it took them that long at that point even to declare the school year was over uh, in, in terms of the in-person learning piece. Um, that's when the planning started to, for September. So even though I know a lot of you are concerned right now, it feels like uh, things are happening last minute and we're delaying start dates, et cetera. Um, I can assure you that the planning has been going on for many, many months. Um, and, and, but we, did, we, we also needed to know what was going on with COVID, case counts, et cetera, et cetera, those pieces that, that mattered so much and take our, our guidance from public health and really keep an eye on where we were in Toronto. Um, and we did all of this, right? We closed down schools and we kept our distance because we knew that we needed to keep those case numbers down and keep uh, ourselves uh, well and keep hospitals uh, from being overwhelmed. Um, uh, and, and the COVID numbers did fall and, and, and the right things were happening uh, on that front, right? And we all remember that um, when we were in, I guess, stage one in Toronto. Uh, and the board, and then at that point, the board's planning really accelerated. Now, I just, I want to tell you the difference between what's, what would have happened in the before times and what happened this summer <laughs> in terms of schools and planning for the fall. Normally, school boards find out about their funding levels, their budget numbers, the raw numbers you have to work with in January, February, you start to find out what the numbers look like. You start to draft your budget in March and April and consult on it and tweak it. You get more detailed numbers. You set your staffing levels. And you pass a budget in April or May. The Education Act actually requires school boards to pass their budgets by June 30th. This year, we got our budget numbers on June 27th. Um, normally, uh, you know, the budget gets passed, so then we know, schools know how many teachers they have, they start building their staffing models, and at the end of school year, ideally, kids know what classes they're in, teachers know uh, who they're teaching. This year, of course, was very, very, very different, um, and some of that had to be different, some of it did not, and that's what I want to talk to you about right now. Um, if we could uh, go to the first slide, Rob, or whoever's sharing the slides. So um, that lovely picture of the hardwired brain on the right, <laughs> that's my brain, that's anyone working in education right now, I think, trying to figure out um, the path forward, and that's been what we've been struggling with all summer. Um, as uh, as the ground shifted uh, multiple times uh, and we were working with different rules and different guidance uh, over and over. So to go back June 19th, the minister directs school boards to come up with three scenarios, remote, hybrid, and fully in school, and to submit those plans by August 4th. So that, that was pretty sensible. At the same time, of course, we're building our budget. June 20th, however, 
the news starts to report, and this was not directly from the Minister of Education to school boards, but coming through the media, which is a pattern with this government, um, which I think it signals the extent to which they really respect uh, teachers and principals and administrators and school boards, that we find these things out through the news that affect uh, our work so dramatically and our kids so dramatically. Um, we start to hear that the minister is going to expect everybody to start with an adapted or hybrid model with cohorts of 15. Okay, so on June 20th, we all thought all of our kids were going to be cohorted in groups no larger than 15. July 9th, uh, however, the minister uh, indicates that the goal is all students in class full time. Next slide. Full, full class, full time. Next slide, thanks. Um, July 15th, the TDSB reviews our, its preliminary plans and announces that we're going to start registering parents by phone. Um, unfortunately, we start to hear almost immediately after the survey has gone out that, uh, or the registration uh, questionnaire is going out, that um, the government is actually going to announce the model rather than have school boards determine the models individually, announce the, their, their framework. Um, so we suspend, in the TDSB, we suspend the registration process at that time. And we go back to the drawing board because on July 30th, the minister announces that his intention is K to eight, full time, full days, and secondary half days, quote unquote. Uh, and that's, an, you know, that's an issue we'll come back to and cohorts of 15 in a quadmestered model. Next slide. Uh, August 4th, the minister uh, with, with the deadline looming staff go back to the drawing board. So this is when we were supposed to be signing off on the models, everything done, baked, and we would have had parent surveys back and we would have known in a general sense who was coming to school and we could have started the work of re-timetabling and, um, and re-staffing schools. August 7th, the TDSB goes back to the ministry with two plans. The one that, they, that fit the announcement they had just made scant few days prior and our plan um, that we had baked way back when for a one to 15 model um, regular day full class sizes with a slightly shortened day. And that plan, not surprising to us, but highly unfortunate. And I think that, that right there was the key moment that the ministry had the chance, that this government had the chance to do things right, and they did not. Uh, August 13th, because of increasing public pressure around class sizes, the ministry tells school boards, well, you can use your reserve funds to augment class sizes if you want to. In, in addition to a 6.3 million, that's the, that's the number for the TDSB. I imagine Mark probably has the province-wide numbers, but that our, our amount was 6.3 million. Add that to the money from our reserves and we can lower class sizes a little bit further. What we chose to do at that time, because we couldn't get across the board much lower and the guidance from public health was what it was, is we lowered class sizes in, um, in uh, higher risk neighborhoods. Next slide. So on August 14th, in response to um, Dr. Eileen Davila's guidance um, that lower class sizes were what we would ideally want, that she drew our attention to the high transmission areas and the need to really focus our efforts, that's what we did. So we've got class sizes 15 or 20, depending on the age for elementary, uh, for the grade rather. Um, and uh, higher class size ratios everywhere else. So they're, they're lower across the system, but they're nowhere where we want them to be, and they are where they should be, I, I would say, in a general sense, in a list of, of uh, higher transmission neighborhoods. August 14th, the board looks at another iteration of the plan. The minister allows staggered starts. August 20th, we finally after um, getting the extra money and, and developing a new plan, we pass um, that plan that I just talked about with uh, lower class sizes, slightly lower across the system and, and much lower in higher priority neighborhoods. I think that's the last slide. 
So here we are today, um, and I probably have gone over time. Um, so to answer the many questions around class size, I think the overarching one people are asking is why isn't the TDSB just getting those numbers lower? And why are we seeing staff being um, surplused at one school when um, there's empty, and then empty classrooms across the hall from kids in a classroom with 27 in some cases because the registration numbers are coming in higher now than they were when we were staffing schools, some classes 28, 29, 30, and empty classrooms across the hall. Why can't the TDSB just hold on to those teachers, keep them in the schools to lower class sizes? And the simple reason is we are funded to, to, to that 27 ratio. We can't, if we go up, we go, we don't have the capacity to run a deficit because school boards do not generate their own funds which is why there was so much noise and so much fight over the summer to do what we can to lower class sizes. On a personal level, I moved a motion in mid-July with my colleague Rachel Chernos Lynn pushing for all levels of government to come together to, for creative and bold solutions around class size, space, ventilation issues, you know, outdoor education, the list goes on. Um, <clears throat> The, the city came fairly quickly. Uh, the mayor, to his credit, said, we will work with you. We'll look at extra spaces and do what we can, help whatever way we can. The province eventually capitulated and gave us a little bit more money, but nowhere close to where we needed to be and really, really late in the game. And the province, is, or the feds, the same thing, right? We all heard that the Liberal government gave a bunch of money late in the um, summer after the staffing models were cooked and we had to staff our schools. So we're still trying to figure out exactly where those funds are gonna go, but I can tell you, I just wanna say very briefly before I pass it over to Marit, that the federal dollars were also um, divided into two allotments. So they're, they're gonna write one check now, one check in January. And a lot of those funds were earmarked for very specific things, student transportation, public health nurses, remote learning, a very large chunk of it for remote learning. Um, so actually for the TDSB, we could only put six million towards staffing. And we decided to, to expand the number of high priority schools to allocate extra teachers to. Um, so uh, I'm sure I haven't answered all of your questions. I'll try to come back to, I'll go through the list now and make sure that I get to more um, uh, in the Q&A section. Thank you. Jen, thanks very much. Before we go to Mara, uh, we have another survey question. Rob, could you put up survey question number two, please? Uh, since I can't see it on my screen, <laughs> Rob, is it up now? If it's up now, uh, if you could please vote attendees so we can get a sense of whether children will be going back to the classroom. Not going back to the classroom, I'm going to assume they're doing remote learning. And if you could vote, just uh, got about 20, 30 seconds to do that. I assume the results are still coming in. Yes. If they're in, Rob, could you please announce the results? Uh, there's still rolling in, Peter. Ah, um, okay. And the the question, uh, straightforward, will your child or children be returning to the classroom? Uh, currently, 79% said yes, and 21% have answered no. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, just a reminder, we're trying to keep up with the questions that you're posting on the Q&A, uh, but also to let you know you can send them directly to me at tappins-co at ndp.on.ca and we'll get back to you. Uh, some we'll share with Jennifer um, that relate directly to your school in this riding to the TDSB, others provincially will respond. And with that, uh, thank you everyone for answering the survey. Mart, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Peter. Um, it's great to be here and uh, over across the other way uh, from the community that I represent, Davenport, but we have a lot in common. 
And, um, and I want to thank also uh, all of uh, Peter's staff and volunteers and everybody who's joining us uh, tonight as well, because I know this, uh, I know from experience, uh, both as a parent myself with a, a daughter who's, one of my daughters is still in, in, in school and will be going back to school, hopefully next week uh, into grade 11. Um, but also uh, as, as the education critic for the official opposition, I know uh, from talking to hundreds and hundreds of parents out there um, and educators, um, how much concern and anxiety this return to school is, is provoking. Um, you know, I've actually participated in education town halls like this across the province over the last few months. And, uh, and it is really wonderful to get a chance to actually also hear from you as parents and education workers and students. I always love to hear from the students and everybody who cares about public education. Now, if you had asked me I don't know, a month ago or two months ago or even you know, six months ago, if we would be in the position that we are in today with schools reopening you know, in, a, in, a day, in days in some parts of the province, in weeks and others, um, and if you had asked me whether the classes for many of our children would be remaining the same size that they were when school broke in March, I, I would not have believed you. I wouldn't have believed you. Um, and as we've heard in the media, and certainly this is what I'm seeing across the province, uh, as I mentioned, there's this growing and tremendous anxiety and concern. And we see that play out, I think, in also the number of, of families who have registered their children to be online or, or working from home and not returning to the classroom. And, and that's happening all across the province, not just in, in sort of COVID hotspots or in areas like Toronto. And um, that, that anxiety, I should point out, of course, is not just being felt by parents and students, but it's also by frontline teachers, those education workers. And also, I, I just want to say, among experts, you know, experts in education, like Dr. Carol Campbell at OISE and the wonderful Dr. Charles Pascal, but also epidemiologists, other medical experts. So that, like, there's a long list, um, many, many of them. And, you know, back in June, the Minister of Education said it himself. He said that students should be going back to classes of no more than 15 students. That's what he envisioned. Why? Because presumably it provides the best possible opportunity for us to distance our students adequately. Um, we all know we've been asking for a long time for, for that kind of distancing to take place in our businesses, our restaurants. Everybody's to maintain these two meters in distance. But for our children, our students, we don't have the same expectations. You know, why? Uh, let's be clear, there are glaring gaps in equity that exist when we don't reduce classroom sizes. We know that. And we know we need to support our most vulnerable students. We know that COVID-19 disproportionately was impacting some communities, racialized communities, low-income communities. So what changed? You know, why is it acceptable to Stephen Lecce and Doug Ford now for us to return to these status quo class sizes in what are really unprecedented times. And I have, I have racked my brain over this, I'll tell you, and I have two answers. I wanted to, to run these by you all. <laughs> I'd love to hear your opinions. You know, first of all, obviously, it's about dollars and cents. Uh, the government has talked a lot about their record funding for education and the dollars they're putting into the return to school. And, and you know what? A lot of it is nonsense. I'll just say it. Uh, you know, their record funding overall pre-pandemic didn't even keep up with inflation. Uh, they are not the first government in the last 25 years to also underfund education because we have seen it over and over and over again, which is partly why we see ourselves in the situation we are in today, where, you know, we are, we are grasping at straws, where there is no flexibility in the system, where, where we have HVAC systems and no ventil, you know, issues and ventilation issues in our schools and a $16.3 billion capital repair backlog. But the proof I think right now is, is in the pudding, right? Um, we, we see it in, in how, as Jennifer's already explained, how this is playing out in our classrooms. And, and as Jennifer noted, they even got some additional dollars from the federal government just a few weeks ago, which as she pointed out, works out to about seven, I think 763 million over the year, but it's coming in two installments, half now, half in January. And you know, 
the government here in Ontario could have just used all of that to reduce class sizes, which to be honest is what I would have expected given the outcry, given the concern out there, given the focus on um, smaller is safer, but they chose not to. And um, we, have, we have now bus routes being canceled across the province because bus drivers, most of whom are older, can't stay safe. They can't ensure the safety of students because they have 70 students or more on a bus and inadequate um, protective equipment. We have classes that should be smaller with many students staying at home or online. And now we're seeing those, as Jennifer pointed out, being merged or collapsed into larger classes. And so ultimately we have our students going back to classes that are the same size or larger than what they left in March. And why is this? And as Jennifer noted, it's because of the way that funding works in Ontario, which is essentially bums in seats. Bums in seats determines staffing allocation. But it's also because the government has kept the same class size averages. And as Jennifer noted, that's basically what they're, what we're funded on, what they're funded on uh, school boards. What they should have done is capped the classes at say 15 and funded it ac accordingly. But the government knew that was, an that was an option and they chose not to. And instead we're seeing teachers and other staff shuffled out of our schools and they're being shuffled into teaching online or in some cases, and you know, I, I'm trying to substantiate some of this, but I'm certainly getting lots of reports of, uh, of staff being surplused. I should, you know, I do wanna add here that that funding formula, that wasn't created by this conservative government. This, this was created by Mike Harris and that conservative government, but it's been around since then. And while folks like me and others who care about public education have been saying desperately, we need to change the funding formula in Ontario, this is not how we should be funding education. The Liberal government prior to this did not change it either. And instead what we've seen happen is a bunch of band-aids slapped on our education system. Um, you know, you throw a band-aid on this issue and you throw a little few million on this issue. And that's, that's great, it might, it might tide us over but band-aids are really easy to tear off. And that's where I think we have a broader conversation to have at some point soon. And certainly it's something we've been advocating for in the opposition NDP is to actually change the way we fund education. That's a whole other uh, topic. But you know, months ago when the legislature was still sitting, I raised many of these issues with the Minister of Education. And, and I even brought forward a motion to enact an emergency action plan. I, I said to the government, let's, let's, here's a long list of things that need to be considered. You know, we need to act immediately. And this was months ago to ensure that there would be additional support for special needs students, um, students that were struggling. Um, instead, uh, and, and, and in addition to that, by the way, also uh, dealing with class sizes, smaller class sizes, um, and, and a number of other issues, including busing. All of these things have not been dealt with. And instead, for example, we have special education or resource teachers being cut because of the large number of people choosing online learning. It has nothing to do with whether or not there are kids with special needs in those classrooms. But we're seeing this happen across the, the province. And again, you know, uh, it's a deep disservice to our children, to our communities, to our boards, who again, as Jennifer pointed out, I mean, I really do think boards have been doing an extremely uh, good job of trying to, to weigh one thing after another and, and try to find solutions, but this is the situation they're left in. So, you know, we also raised concerns about that inequity that's inherent in online education and, and really the false choice that's being presented to parents. And since then, the government came up with this bargain basement plan and they've created chaos by, as Jennifer showed, continually changing guidelines and directives. And this is something we've seen from board to board all across the province uh, without, without fail. So here we are with many schools still scrambling. And, uh, and I do wanna again acknowledge the extraordinary work that school boards have done across the province, really exceptional. And I wanna thank Jennifer and the other trustees who have actually really stepped up and pushed the government publicly to do more, to fund more, to step up. Um, and, and like I said, they've come up with a lot of solutions to issues. Um, and I know that our principals and our teachers are doing the same. They are using everything they have.
to try to come up with solutions to keep our children safe and, and learning. And I loved the way that Jennifer put it, safe, social, and learning. But back to the government, the, only, the other reason why Ford and Lecce are digging in their heels when they have other options is I think a deeper and even more worrying issue. And I just want to um, kind of, I'm gonna wrap up here and then I talk about some of the actions we can take. But I urge you to look back to when this government was first elected and they, they, had a, they commissioned a report from Ernst & Young to look at where they could find savings and in, in among, among other things in education. And what they were presented with was, well, you should try voucher or charter school options. Now, uh, Google Betty DeVos, you know, look up what's happened in the United States with the proliferation of charter or voucher schools and the privatization of education. And what you see is the degradation of, of public education. Uh, and that is where this potentially leads us. So, you know, that undermining of public education, the lack of respect for it, and frankly, looking for other opportunities to, to again, privatize aspects of our education system. So, um, but I, I'm going to stop there with my background, and I'm going to I'm going to end on just one other note, which is that this is not over. Uh, Doug Ford and Stephen Lecce have uh, recently, you would have noticed, started to play a bit of a blame game. They like to blame the unions for things going sideways, or they're going to blame the boards. They're blaming the teachers. Why? Because they are feeling the heat from parents and communities. And, and that's because of a lot of amazing work that's been happening, I think, um, uh, on the ground in our communities. And a lot of it has come from parents, the same folks who I think stood side by side in, as Jennifer pointed out, you know, a year ago, um, pushing the government not to cut education, not to lay off teachers, not to increase class sizes. And so to me, what we're hearing now is a really good sign, actually. It's kind of awful, but it's also a really good sign that they are feeling the heat. And that means that we can make change. We sure can. So I'm going to urge you, I think there's a, a number of really amazing organizations, and I may miss some, and I apologize, I apologize if I do, but Ontario Parent Action Network, uh, Ontario Families for Public Education, there's a new group called Ontario Safe that a, a teacher, um, sorry, well, she's really a parent in my community uh, in Davenport um, uh, came up with a petition that was signed by 250,000 parents and that we delivered, uh, she and I, to Doug Ford at Queen's Park. And they've got a new organization called Ontario Safe. Um, follow those organizations on Facebook, um, in social media, on Twitter. They are, they are always unveiling new opportunities, uh, ways to write and call and sign petitions. And I know everybody feels like they've done a thousand of those, but I have to tell you, we need to keep it up. Um, and I also wanna just share um, a, a website. It's called protectourschools.ca that was formed by some of these organizations. And it's a publicly searchable database of concerns and issues and safety issues in our schools. And it's a really great way for us to continue to show, shine some light on these issues so we can get the government to invest more. Speak with your parent councils at your schools. Uh, it's really important that we get those parent councils activated um, and thinking about this, not as such a local issue, but as a big, broad pro province-wide issue. Because if we don't make the change at the provincial level, we're not going to change anything. We need you to pass resolutions uh, at, your, at your school councils and, and bring those, bring those to, send them to the conservative MPPs, send them to Doug Ford and Stephen Lecce, and don't forget to send them to us too, so we can raise it in the legislature when the legislature returns next week. So it's not over. We're fighting. We're fighting with you. And, and thanks so much. I'll turn it back to you, Peter. Okay. Mara, thanks very much. And both panelists, I really appreciate uh, all that you've put out so far this evening. Before we go to questions and comments, I'd like to put up the results of the survey that we did and almost 2,000 of you filled out. Uh, Rob, can you put that on? on share screen and we'll just go through one by one. I feel like Steve Pakin here. <laughs> sorry, you have to you have to bear with me for a minute. I was looking at uh, at another poll question, sorry. Yeah, that's fine.
And just while Rob is doing that, I don't know if people can see, we've got about 125 participants right now, and we've had people coming and going. So I imagine quite a few people will be seeing this this evening. It's also going out on Facebook Live. So a fair amount will see it this evening. Uh, we're recording this whole event with the intention of posting it on Facebook uh, so that people can refer others to it in the next while. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Ah, great. Okay, so the, this is the results of the survey we did. Uh, to give you a sense of who participated, 72% of those who filled out the surveys are parents, 38% were concerned community members, and I have to say there's great interest amongst grandparents, uh, aunts, uncles, relatives, and friends of families that have children in the school system. So we hear a lot from them. Uh, educators, obviously, this is a key issue for them. They've spent a lot of time in the last few years fighting to defend funding for class. And I was really appreciative that they joined in. And students at 1%, it's their future. They're very interested in making sure they have a school system that works. Rob, if we could go to the next slide. So this was interesting. Are you aware of Ford's reopening plan for Toronto and Ontario for September? Uh, I was impressed how high the level of awareness was at 97%. I have to say to those of you who are here this evening, I talked to a lot of people in Toronto and Danforth, and I talked to a lot of people across Ontario. Um, it is amazing to have that level of awareness of something just in the political sphere extraordinarily high thanks rob if you could go to the next one uh, on august 13th ontario's principles council requested class size reductions to support physical distancing how important is physical distancing in a back to school plan rank your responses well as you can see 75 percent of those who participated ranked it as their top concern. And frankly, uh, from uh, people who ranked it as a seven or higher, uh, you're talking about 90%. Very, very strong understanding of what it's gonna take to make sure that we can control the spread of disease in the schools. And I thought it was interesting that the Ontario Principals Council came out with this position. Uh, they're, very professional in their approach to education, uh, pretty coldly objective. And if they're calling for smaller class sizes, uh, they're not doing it out of any self-interest. They're doing it because they wanna make sure the schools work. Uh, Rob, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, Ford government initially committed the province to provide 16,000 additional dollars per school to hire more educators. Uh, we asked people whether this was adequate. As you can see, 92% uh, said it was too little. Um, we had 2% who said it was just right. The, the findings are pretty clear. People understand that $16,000 per school is not enough to actually give us the level of staffing necessary to provide for safe schools with small enough classes. Rob, is there another slide there? Okay, what part of the plan would you like to see improved? Uh, obviously, number one is decrease in class size, 91%. This is multiple choice. Um, update schools with ventilation systems that will improve airflow inside, 77%. Uh, more custodians and nurses to help with health and cleaning, 63%. All students required to wear a mask, 49%, so half and half, and no changes needed, 1%. It's pretty clear from this that everyone who was involved in filling out this form and people who are following the issue are also pretty closely following what's being said in the public health sphere. And so people understand what the most important issue is to 
protect the safety of our children and reduce the chances of transmission of disease. Uh, thank you, Rob. Is there another slide here? No. Okay. That's the slideshow. Um, thanks very much, Rob, and thank you to everyone who took part in sending in that survey. Um, we do have a number of questions. I'll start um, with this one. Are reductions in class sizes something that is still being considered? More funding? Question mark. I understand that resources are not available for this and classes are therefore being cohorted to achieve maximum student numbers per class. This seems absurd knowing that there will be classroom spaces that are not being utilized and physical distancing measures just ignored. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to start off with a comment on that? Sure, I'd be happy to and then Marit may want to follow. Um, so class size ratios or like the 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 caps if you will that have been set are um are can't move lower unless we get more funding so it is it is pretty much that simple it is ludicrous i completely agree with everyone who believes that it is ludicrous that we are seeing in some cases not in toronto danforth i'll say at this point but in some parts of the city teachers having to teach um, three grades um, because there's the numbers are low and they're having to create those classes of say 27 kids and, and pull them from three different grades to reach the cap while there's an empty classroom across the hall. Um, that is ludicrous. The only way to fix that is with more teachers. Um, it, it, and those empty classrooms and those collapsing is because over across the system, something like 30% have chosen remote. And it's a, chick, it's a chicken egg thing, right? The more people choose remote, the more um, we, we pack the remaining kids into those split classes, the more people feel nervous about in-class um, programming, the more people may choose remote. So. Um, that's why, like Marit said, advocacy is so important. Um, what I mentioned earlier that in August I moved a motion um, pushing the province on a number of things. The wording of my motion was based on a letter that started at a school in the beaches and was repeated by six, seven, eight, nine schools in my ward and dozens across the system. Parents and educators together organized. They knew what they needed and what our schools want uh, to, for a safe return. And they articulated it and they sent it everywhere and they shouted it from the rooftops. And I did that in the boardroom and shared it with the media and you know, went on Metro Morning and on and on, did whatever we could to make as much noise as possible. The government ended up responding with, with another um, you know, six million. It wasn't enough. The feds. The federal government eventually decided to do the same, too late I would say, but still every time we yell, <laughs> every time we sign a petition, every time we advocate, we make a difference. And I, I just want to add one thing because I'm, I'm reading the chat and thinking about the questions that have come in and the many, many conversations I've had with parents in Toronto Danforth over the summer. And that is to say, I think it's really important for all of us, because you're taking time out of your evening tonight to think about these issues and to organize, to connect around these issues. I think it's really important for us to, um, to not let um, the, the circumstances weigh us down and feel like, feel defeated, that, 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 um, I think, Jennifer, we've lost you for a moment. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Amazing, talented, and passionate educators are going to be in classrooms with our kids. And our kids are going to be hungry to learn. I'm seeing on the screen that it says my, internet, my connection's unstable, so if you can't hear me, I apologize. Um, and still amazing, wonderful, magical things will happen with our kids in education because our, because um, that learning moment will still be provided. It won't be what we know. There'll be masks. There'll be worry and anxiety on all sides. But um, I think it's really important for us to continue to have faith 
and to channel our worry into opportunities to organize. So whether it's the groups that Marit listed off, whether it's petitions and letters, whether it's press conferences, whatever it is you can think to do. Um, and I certainly share opportunities when, I, when they, they come my way. Ontario Safe, like Marit mentioned, is a group that's growing in momentum that uh, we should all be following on social media and engaging with. Um, showing our support for our teachers unions, who I'd say in many ways have led the fight. Um, we really need to, uh, to continue to sort of channel that worry and that anxiety into action. I think not just for our own well-being and for the well-being of the system, but for our kids. I think they need to see that. Mm. Jennifer, thanks for that. Mark, I'm going to give you another question, which is a variation on that one, but with a slightly different angle. Uh, number one thing parents want the province to do is mandate and fund lower class sizes everywhere. Is there anything we can do? And I know you talked to that, Mark, but I'll go further. Uh, anything we can do that we haven't already been doing as parents to force this. All the emails and phone calls are not moving the dial on this. If you have any advice, please share! Exclamation mark. <laughs> I feel you. <laughs> um, and I, and I, um, you know, I, I think Jennifer addressed some of that, but yeah, I feel that. And uh, I know it feels like we haven't gotten anywhere, but I do want to point out we are, we are, we are moving the dial a little, right? Like it's just little bits, but I can tell that they're feeling the heat and that's where we need them. So, you know, we shouldn't underestimate Peter and I know as MPPs and Jennifer knows as a trustee that actually getting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails and letters, it tells you something about where your community's at, especially when it's coming from people in your community. And so that's another thing I would say is, you know, reaching out to people you know in those communities uh, where they have conservative government MPPs, super important. But continuing those calls to Leche and uh, Ford is really also really important. But you know what I've been um, looking for actually increasingly, and I've done some outreach myself to, to try to encourage um, folks to do this, but I really would like to hear from more employers. I think employers need to make their voices heard. Yeah. Uh, those businesses that have really struggled, that are just trying to get up and running again and know what is at stake. And I know that, you know, there's you know, so many aspects to this and it breaks my heart really to see the anxiety among our, especially our kids with this approach that the government's taken. Um, but, but we know that part of what's happening right now is this push to get um, to get back to work, get people back into employment so that they can, so that we can have the economic renewal that we need, right? And if we're going to have that though, we can't have our schools shut, you know, shut down and then um, a COVID, massive COVID outbreak. And so, and I know having talked to lots of, you know, I've talked to lots of employers, I'm sure you all have too, like folks in our community, people I know who are like, this is going to be really bad if this happens. And we can't afford this. And the government is taking a really laissez-faire approach, actually. You know, they keep saying, well, like Stephen Lecce's latest line is something like, I'm going to get this wrong, but it's like um, layers of actions. And it's like, and then we'll, well, we've made all these layers of actions, but we, we have more we can do. Well, do it now. What are you waiting for? You know, the outbreak? It'll be too late. So I, I really would encourage people um, to see, and Ontario Safe has been doing that. One of their objectives um, has been to try to bring those voices forward, sort of other voices. And um, I think it's really effective. And I'd, I'd really encourage folks to, if you have any connections to like the Toronto Board of, Region Board of Trade or the Chamber of Commerce or anything like that, like get the pressure out there. Those big organizations also need to be speaking out about this. Thank you. I'm going to give the next one to you, Jennifer. It's my understanding that staffing allocation is based upon student enrollment. Who's responsible for this funding model of staff allocation? Mike Harris? Jennifer? Mike Harris, I would say. I mean, I, I think school boards have always, I, I'm not familiar with what the funding uh, for, formula looked like pre, um, uh, pre Mike Harris. I know it well now. Um, I suspect that uh, schools always um, organized uh, the staffing to some degree like that. The difference was that school boards could decide what, they, what their priorities were. So they could say, for example, you know what, we think that a grade 10 academic English class works okay with 30 kids, but we think that uh, kids who need extra help um, uh, 
need a smaller class size. We think that kids uh, with, that with various special needs need a smaller class size. We think kids in shop running heavy equipment need a smaller class size. And they could set their priorities, or we, you could say, we think people in underserved communities should have smaller class sizes, right? Point being, school boards had the leeway for many years to set those class sizes themselves and fund and then tax and levy uh, accordingly to set to meet their priorities. That's what was lost with Mike Harris. And then every year since, as Marit pointed out, with the Liberal government for many years and, and through to now with the, with the Conservative government, that, that formula has never been repaired. So I would say it's not so much the allocations uh, based on staffing that's the problem, it's the fact that they're just too big. Right? And, and the fact that school boards don't have the flexibility. Every year, we, we've seen an austerity approach to education funding for 20 plus years now. And every year, and with the, I think the exception of two, those priorities and those um, possibilities have been whittled down and whittled down and whittled down. Whether the number of administrators in the office, the number of custodians cleaning a school, the number of librarians available, the number of resource staff allocated to a school, the amount of professional development that teachers get, all those things that are seen as extras and nothing I just listed for you, I don't think you would think as an extra, those things get whittled and whittled and whittled away. Thank you. Um, Mara, I'm going to come to you with this question. What's the Ford government done with the federal funding for school modifications? Ah, well, um, so as I mentioned earlier, there's 763, now I'm forgetting, a million dollars that was the, our Ontario's portion of the two billion that was recently announced. And um, the government, the Ford government immediately came out with how they were going to break that down. And very little of it um, is going to, to staffing at all. I mean, they've, they've, they've portioned it up in tiny little bits. And again, I, I have to say, like, it's, it sounds like nothing to sneeze at, right? I mean, 700, almost $800 million is nothing to sneeze at. And it's certainly welcome. But it, if, when you break it into two piles, so it's like 381, I think, um, million, in September and then 381 million in January, 381 million is really what we're dealing with now. And and when you when again you look at what we've are what we're what the, the provincial government has put in, you know, it's really it really doesn't add up to much. So I was looking at some math that the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives did um, on this and and then kind of doing my own number crunching too. And if you think about it, so the government says they put 30 million into teachers. Now I, I can't confirm that that's exactly what it's going into because we'll have to do some number crunching and, and we'll have to ask some tough questions when we get an opportunity, but that's what they say. That would be the equivalent of hiring 371 teachers. Then you add in um, the 70 million, which is what the provincial government said was going to go to hiring of teachers, which is the part that would reduce class sizes, right? And it would work out to about 800 uh, teachers. So that I think adds up to like um, 1,100 teachers, give or take, and and that really works out to be about one teacher for every four schools. And I think you had some math earlier, and I, I think that we you know it keeps changing a little, but it's changing a little tiny bit. It's certainly not a whole person; <laughs> it's a quarter of a person in each of our schools, which is completely inadequate. And you know the government keeps saying. Um, they keep, and, and so I just like, that's basically how they broke it down. A few, you know, a few million for busing, a few million here, a few million there. And then also a chunk that they're putting aside, uh, for, you know, a rainy day. What if something goes wrong? And again, I say, well, let's use it now. What are you waiting for? We don't want the rainy day. So, um, but I also wanted to point out that, um, that if, if, as the government says, every board in the province were to use their reserves, which I can't remember if Jennifer got into this, but you know, uh, she's probably better placed to explain what's left of reserves in most boards, but it's not very much. Most, some boards have nothing at all, really. Um, but in any case, when they're told you can, oh yes, you can use this 500 million in reserves to, to add staff, um, it, that's, that's a really a bit of a, uh, of a fallacy 
it's very unfair uh, depiction as if it's really up to boards to, to deal with this and as if those dollars aren't actually already going into something that they have to pay for. And, um, but even if they used all those monies, it would still result in only one teacher for every, one more teacher for every 700 students in Ontario. So that gives you some sense. I mean, let's just face it. We have a giant, we're a big province. We got a lot of students and, and we have a lot of schools and we need more. And uh, I mean, we don't, we don't look a gift horse in the mouth. We're happy to have the funding from the federal government. Uh, and, the gov and the government here is using it in lots of different ways, but they aren't putting it where I think most of the experts are saying it should go. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Jennifer, next one for you. How will COVID-19 screening of each staff member and student impact entry speed into schools? Schools with hundreds of students would seem like it would take hours to get everyone inside. Can you speak to that? Um I can speak to it in very broad strokes. Um, each school will have, you know, the number of entrances and the number of people there that they allocate based on what makes sense for that site. But in general terms, what we're asking is for parents, and I believe an email, well, schools are emailing out uh, uh, all week this week to their respective parent communities with a lot of these details. But in broad strokes, we're asking people to do a self assessment at home before they walk out the door. So we're asking parents to do that with their kids um, or for high school kids for them to take stock of that. There's an app uh, that is that is going out. I, I don't have the details in front of me about when that's available and who, I think it's starting with secondary. Uh, and that, so the check at school, point being the check at school is supposed to just be sort of a reminder, a you, did you do your self-assessment? Everything good, not feeling any symptoms, okay, in you go. I, I, we are cautioning everyone to have an abundance of patience on that first day as those details um, or as people sort of go through this for the first time and I'm confident that it will, it will speed up only as fast as, as we can do it safely and, and well um, as the days progress. Um, yes, it will take time. Absolutely, 100%, it will take time. Um, but it has to be done. It's an, it's an essential part of the, the back to school process. And I, I would say too, that, you know, when you talk about staffing resources, like, you know, all of these things um, take people, they take bodies and they take uh, time. And, um, you know, it wouldn't it have been great if we had one public health nurse per school to, to make sure that these sorts of, of protocols were facilitated the best way possible. Um, our staff will do the best they can, but yes, there'll be some delays. Uh, over time, it will get better. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just a reminder to everyone, um, we're trying to keep up with your questions as they come in that you put on the, the Q&A. Uh, just a note as well, you can send them directly to me, tabinsp-co at ndp.on.ca, and we'll be back to you about those. Uh, Mart, I have a a comment with a request for you to comment. This government forced an historic teacher strike in large part because they wanted carte blanche to increase class sizes. They wanted all limits to class size removed from collective agreements for elementary and secondary students. So much invested to fight for large class sizes. They seem terrified of parents learning that smaller classes will benefit all students. Can you comment? Yeah. Um... It, absolutely. Um, we have seen uh, a government, as we, we pointed out, you know, a year ago, we were fighting to, to um, I think a lot of us were fighting to keep our class sizes smaller, right? So the irony here is, <laughs> is, is really intense, especially given the situation we're in is, is kind of unprecedented, certainly, but gives you a sense of why that's so important. Um, and uh, I think the other thing I was going to mention is, that you know, over the last few months, um, as, because I was a trustee too, like Jennifer, you know, I, I know a little bit about what happens in terms of those shifts and changes and reallocations. <laughs> and you know, oftentimes as parents, we see some of that shift happening in the fall, in September, uh, October, where you know maybe there's some class changes and things move around a little. And that's often because they are trying to shift and deal with the fact that you know what are the real number of kids that show up at school at the beginning of the year, right? Um, and 
And I, so I started to kind of talk to the media about this. They would always ask me, people would always ask me, do you, you know, after they'd ask all the other questions, they'd say, is there anything else you'd like to add? And I would say, yes, please tell parents that if they're keeping their kids out of school and they think that that's going to benefit the other kids, that's not the reason to do it. Um, that it is, it is, it is not going to result in smaller class sizes for the kids who are left in school. And I know that there are many reasons, uh, many good reasons why people have chosen to, to you do the online option and, you know, lots of reasons. But if that was on your mind, just put it aside because that is not how this will work. So I think a lot of us and the school board certainly saw that coming. And so it's been very heartbreaking to see that lack of, you know, really also the lack of confidence in the reopening because it's had this impact of, of forcing actually, ironically, even larger class sizes. Like it's just not going to impact uh, the way that people hope it will. And, and I, my real concern too in all of this is that that is part of, you know, why maybe the government isn't moving. I can't understand why, given all the evidence and everything we know and what we're seeing in other jurisdictions around the world, why this government wouldn't move to a smaller class size cap. Like it is, it we're setting ourselves up for failure. And, um, and, and I think they know that. And that's why I really worry about what their long-term objectives are actually. Um, but in the meantime, you know, the, mo the one thing we're all focused on is we don't want COVID outbreaks. We don't want our kids getting sick. We don't want our elders getting sick. And, and we don't want our communities shut down again. And I think this government has, has made a choice. And, um, and unfortunately, we have to shame them into, uh, into doing the right thing. Okay. I hope that answers the question. Um, thank you. I, I know you two will not be surprised panelists that we're getting a lot of questions in. Um, I'm going to ask you to be a bit shorter with your responses so we can cover as much ground as we can in the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, can anyone shed light on the role of unions during the last days of scrambling over school organization? Have they been involved? Uh, Mark, Jennifer, either of you? Um, I, can, I can try. Um, sure. you know, I talked to all stakeholders, including um, representatives from our education sector unions and all the boards. And, uh, and I would say they're very involved in the local, right, in, in conversations with boards. And, and that's very much happening. And I think to be what, what, what I'm hearing is it's actually quite positive that, that a lot of, you know, that there is actually good collaboration happening. I mean, there's going to be issues. I mean, you know, um, a, a teacher or an education worker's uh, work environment is is a child's learning environment. So I, I believe that when they're pushing for health and safety in the workplace, that benefits our kids actually. But, but you know, I think that it's been generally, um, what I'm hearing from everybody is it's been quite collaborative and meaningful and good, but where it has failed is at the provincial level. So, um, you know, Mr. Lecce and, and Ford like to talk about how they're talking to the unions all the time and that's just simply not true and when they are it's really they're just reporting out to the unions there's there's very little feedback given um, there's very little opportunity to work things through and and there's definitely a sense that that you know that they have that the workers have not been listened to and again you know the issues they're pushing are the same issues that I think as parents we care about it's the smaller size class it's safety um, it's, it's opportunities for them to be more creative, but, but they want that protection too. So that's my short answer. Okay. Thank you. Jennifer, um, have you had any indication how occasional teachers will be allocated to work, i.e. go to schools as usual or limited to one or to two schools only? I don't have an answer for that handy, but I can look that up and send that out to whoever submitted it. Yeah. Okay. Um, for I my staff. Here. I just don't have it at the tip of my tongue, sorry. Can I just say, no. I think it is actually, like, it's been hard to find that out um, ah. for us too around the province. Um, it makes sense to me that you would be looking to restrict um, occasional or supply yeah. teachers to like one or two schools, but we, we aren't hearing that that's happening and it, it may be that it's still, boards are working it out, I don't know. Okay, well, I'll just note to my staff who are following the questions, if you could note that one down uh, for us to turn over to Jennifer and make sure we have the email address of the person who needs the response. Uh, two related questions. Um, 
what is being done to promote clean air in older schools? Uh, and secondly, how are schools being supported in establishing outdoor education where possible? Is specific funding being budgeted and spent for supporting outdoor learning? Who's overseeing those budgets? I'll just note, we're getting a lot of questions about outdoor learning. And Jennifer, I'll start with you about clean air in the schools and about outdoor learning, if you could address that. Okay, I'll try to be quick uh, as well as thorough, but um, so outdoor, sorry, uh, ventilation, that's the first question? Yeah, how, okay. how are we um, making sure that we've got good ventilation in older schools? Right, so um, ventilation, Mart tweeted about this not so long ago, and I remember thinking, that's exactly right. Ventilation systems in old schools take months to repair. They don't, it doesn't happen quickly. So, um, and this is actually a really good example of the kind of thing that this provincial government, I think, could have flagged a long, long time ago. We could have started uh, the work and done a lot more over the summer. Um, so so um, we're not gonna be seeing massive overhauls of, of HVAC systems in schools uh, by September. Uh, clearly. We will see some of that work happen throughout the school year, but we are seeing like filters are being, you know, all the filters are being changed, systems are being cleaned out, there are some upgrades happening, windows um, that can open will be open as much as possible, the, the rate of air exchange will be turned up to the maximum and turned up earlier in the day. So every, in other words, everything that we can do with existing systems we will do and we are repairing and tweaking uh, as much as we can in the months ahead. Um, I would say that the funding for that uh, has been woefully inadequate, particularly in old schools where like Marit pointed out on Twitter, in many of our schools, you can't do this kind of work without coming up against uh, asbestos, for example, right? And there's, a, you know, as, as there should be extensive protocols around how you deal with asbestos and, and renovations that slows things down. So that's the challenge with the ventilation. On the outdoor ed front, we are offering uh, PD and webinars and encouraging our teachers to get outside as much as possible, um, and they will be. I know that many teachers are, are keen to get outside as much as possible. That's not, um, uh, that, that won't solve every challenge, right? Um, because there's gonna be, uh, in some school yards, there's gonna be a limited amount of space and a lot of demand. Um, for that space. We're going to be having distance recesses. We have child cares out there um, using the space. We have people at the classes doing their recess, but then also breaks where we're scheduling in mask break time so kids can be outside for 10 minute stretches to just, you know, have some time with their mask off apart from each other because we, we recognize that wearing a mask all day is going to be challenging. Um, so all that is to say it's, it, I know it doesn't, it's not the most satisfying answer for people, but it's, it really is important to let our teachers and our principals figure out how to do that outside time, how to share the schoolyard and how to maximize that space the best they can. So the best person to talk to is your principal and your classroom teacher about how they're going to do that. Okay, um, just a follow on on that. Is it a teacher prerogative or can we insist as parents if certain classes within schools are deemed less safe? Sorry, can you restate? Um, with regard to outdoor learning, is it a teacher prerogative or can we insist as parents if certain classes within schools are deemed less safe? Less safe, I don't understand the less safe part. Well, if, if you've got a class that um, has much higher level of breathing, for instance, oh, some heavy exercise and it's well, seen as being less safe, who uh, gets to, to decide I, on that? It, it's, it, we, it, I mean, that yet yeah, it is teacher prerogative, but I don't want to say that I, I don't I don't say that in a in a negative sense. Um, the reason that it's got to be a decision of the teachers because they've got to be they've got to be able to figure out how to teach what they want to teach outside because you got to think about the fact that once you're outside, you don't have your uh, all your equipment all the things that you would be using, the tools of the trade, if you will, in the classroom. It's harder to often to manage classes um, when um, there's lots of distractions. There could be other classes outside and no walls. So it's really important that our educators feel confident in, um, that they can actually teach effectively in that outdoor space. Having said that, I am confident that many of them can and will and will want to. Um, so I'm just asking for folks to be patient with that and have those conversations with the school as the days unfold. Okay. 
Uh, also, weather. Weather is going to be a huge factor. And I know a lot of people, I'm just going to, I'm just going to jump in and say one thing now because I'm getting a lot of emails about it, about tents mm -hmm. and people wanting tents um, uh, or canopies or what have you. There are a number of reasons why they also aren't um, the magical solution that people might think they are. For one, they have, they would have to be cleaned. Any surfaces that people touch have to be cleaned. So we're expanding the amount of space or that, that our, our custodial staff will have to take care of. They have to be stored overnight. We don't have security. Or, they, or if they're not stored, they get vandalized. They also reduce airflow. So there's a question mark. They, they, they have to be open on three sides, minimum, to still have the benefit of being outdoors. Um, uh, those are just a few things. And then there's the, the equity question mark. Is it okay that these five schools in my ward whose school council can the, raise the money to, to buy tents um, gets that privilege, but then other schools that don't have that fundraising capacity won't have that access. The solution should have been with tents, and this is another thing, this government could have had, you know, had the foresight to, to supply um, funds for and, and contracts to source um, that kind of equipment for our, our teachers ahead of time. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to you, Marit. Today it's been reported that the Financial Accountability Office at the legislature reported the Ford government is sitting on millions of dollars that have been unused for dealing with COVID in the schools. Can you explain, sorry, not just the schools, dealing with COVID in the province of Ontario. Can you explain why this is the case? <laughs> well, I think we all wonder why this is the case. Um, that was quite a report that the Financial Accountability Office put out today. And by the way, you know, they're a completely independent um, arm's length uh, organization um, that, that uh, Peter and I uh, meet with occasionally because yeah, they are able to do this kind of research that maybe you know, we as MPPs will not have access to because they can and they have a mandate to do that. So good for them. Uh, yeah, so why are they doing it? I don't know. Uh, it's to maybe pad their, uh, their, their budget so that they look like they, they are in better shape perhaps than they were. But I mean, it, it's pretty clear to me that a lot of those, that, you know, we see it. We see it not just in education, but elsewhere, that the dollars have not flowed that big at pronouncements about innovation or whatever, that the, the people are not actually hearing it back about their applications for that kind of grant money. So it's, it's I do wanna say though, there was one thing in there about education that I think we need to make clear, which is that they, they did note that like half of those federal dollars had not had not flowed yet, but that is actually an issue of the federal government. The federal government has not flowed those those dollars yet, and they won't do it until January. So um, you can't lay that one on the province this time. But all the other dollars, I mean, maybe Peter even has some more <laughs> comments on this than I do. But I think it's uh, it's a um, I I think that this government doesn't want to actually spend the money that it takes to actually get Ontarians through this difficult time. And the FAO uh, shone a light on that today. In, in fact, I don't have anything to add, Mark. I think you've explained it really well. Um, another day, I'll talk about games that governments play with funding and announcements, uh, but not this evening. Um, Jennifer, a question for you. Teacher librarians have been redeployed to classrooms to lower class sizes. We would not have had to do that if the province had properly funded class sizes in elementary, and it's not in any way indicative of any uh, long-term will to undermine libraries back to the need to fix the funding formula. I understand fully and have no um, I think you're, I think blame. You're reading, you're reading my her question and then my answer and then she replied back saying, can you comment on libraries? Is that the one? <laughs> yes. Can you please say something regarding school libraries? Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure that's a very big question, but I can just say that there's no, there's no intent among any trustees that I'm aware of, <laughs> I can say with confidence, I'd say there's unanimity among the board of trustees that libraries uh, should be preserved and we need to keep those spaces. My understanding is that the teacher librarians were redeployed to lower class sizes and also because we were supposed to be keeping cohorts in their classroom and they're only basically going classroom, washroom break outside. That's it, that's the travel. Um, they're not rotating through uh, other spaces. So, um, 
and there's concerns around handling books and the need to clean books, etc. Um, so this is a COVID response. This is not a, an attempt in any way, shape or form to undermine the role of teacher librarians uh, or libraries in our schools. I will um, lie myself down on the train tracks before I would let this lead to that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, actually, Jennifer, my next is for you as well. Has the board discussed uh, teachers needing to stay home with regard to quarantine and are teachers using their personal sick days for this? That is a question I'd have to ask our employee services folks. I, I don't have an answer at the tip of my tongue on that, sorry. Okay, well then, again, I'll ask my staff uh, to get the contact information for the person who asked that question so that we can get the information directly I, to I would them. also say too that that's also the kind of thing that at the provincial level I would have hoped would be negotiated as well, right? That, that yeah, there should you're be right. calls around that province-wide. They shouldn't be depend, they shouldn't change board to board. Actually, you're quite correct. Marit, are you in a position to answer that well, question? Well, no, and I think that's, that that is part of the problem is that it is being negotiated board by board, as I understand it. Uh, you know, it's being left to boards to make, to, to have those calls. And so that's that's probably partly why we're not we're getting different responses. Like I've heard certainly different things from around the province. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the time and we, we're leaving a few minutes at the end just for wrap up. So Jennifer, I'm gonna ask you the last question uh, and then we'll go to wrap up you two. Uh, childcare staff aren't mandated to ensure the masking of students. School teachers are as per Toronto Public Health Guidelines, including K to three in schools with shared space with child care providers and kids at the child care and the teacher and school students. Different rules are different for different groups utilizing the same space. Are you in a position to comment on that? Um, I, I did try to, I think that question is from Gordon Orr. Hi, Gordon. Yes. Um, Hi, Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, that, is, that is new information to me. I thought that the standards were the same across the board. So I told Gordon to email me uh, my TDSB account. And I'll try and get an answer on that. Um, I mean, yeah, child care centers are third party operators. Their rules are set by the, the city uh, of Toronto. So um, um, that is important to reconcile. It might not be a quick fix, but uh, that is a very important thing to look at. So thanks for flagging that, Gordon. Okay. Um, folks, with that, I'm gonna cut off the questions and I, I'm sure that there are lots more, uh, but we're gonna wrap up at 8.30. Uh, Jennifer, Marit, if um, we could have you make some closing remarks. Marit, I'll start with you and then Jennifer, give you the last word. Um, well, thanks so much, Peter. This has been actually, this has been great. It's been really fun. And uh, my favorite thing to do is talk about education <laughs> and, uh, and talk to people who are clearly so engaged, uh, all of you who are watching in, in this conversation. And, they, and I know for different reasons too, right? You know, I know there's probably some grandparents on here and aunts and uncles and, and parents, we, we, we did the survey, so we know. Um, I, I want to say something that I think uh, that somebody last night, I, I had a town hall in my own community and um, there was a high school teacher um, on, on the call. And one of the things that she said, which really rung true for me as the parent of a, of a high school student, you know, for, for those of us in the TDSB or any of the boards, the designated boards, um, that have kids in high school, it's been, I'm not going to say it's been an easier choice because none of it's easy, but I do feel like it was for me a bit easier knowing that they could go to school with this smaller cohort, like 15 kids in a class. And, and that's not the case in many parts of the province, right? They're also going back to status quo, big classrooms. Um, but it was a little easier for me. It's still complicated. And I know the TDSB is trying really hard to make this work for, for those students. Um, but something struck me, which is, that myself included, um, as parents, we are very active in our parent councils when our kids are younger. It's a big thing. Like we, if you're going to be, that's when you're most active. Um, and we tend to not be as active later on. And that's because our kids are very independent. The issues are different and it's just different. And I get that. But she was saying, you know, it's really important that we as parents also uh, get active at that level in the secondary schools uh, because there are going to continue to be issues and we need to make sure that uh, those those issues are also being raised by those parent councils so that's one thing i, I really did want to say i thought it was a really good point and i felt it um and and the other thing is you know please keep your 
your issues, keep sharing your concerns and your stories with us and with Peter here, uh, because um, it's really very effective uh, when we're able to bring those, so those actual concerns from real people uh, into the legislature. And we're going to have uh, opportunities starting on Monday, I hope, to ask um, the Minister of Education and the Premier lots of questions about this and push them really hard and get media attention. And so your stories and concerns and issues, your voices are, are really, really important in this. And, um, and we sure appreciate um, all that you are all doing out there. And uh, that's all I have to say. And thank you also, oh, to all the education workers um, I know this is a really tough time and it, it means a lot. I know for you to have the, the parents have your back. Uh, we're there for you. And, um, but, uh, we, we really appreciate all that you're, you're, you're facing and all that you're doing too. And I know you're also looking forward to seeing our kids, um, come back to school. Okay. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Um, I would just close by saying, um, that the Toronto Danforth community never, ceases to amaze me with the depth of activism, articulate, powerful, passionate, um, and well-directed activism that makes a difference. And I am so proud to represent this community and to represent the schools here in Toronto Danforth. And I would say just keep on keeping on, keep on fighting, keep on organizing, maybe add a little bit of Thank you to your principals who are who are doing um, miracle working miracles in their schools right now. Um, do what you can to thank the staff because it's going to be a rocky road. It's going to be a rocky road for all of us this year. We could easily end up back in full dime full school for everybody because our numbers look good. We could just as easily, probably more likely to be honest, be pivoting back to a fully remote situation. This isn't going to be. It's not even, it's not just not going to be a normal year, it's going to be a very difficult year. Um, so I would say take care of yourselves, take care of each other, keep up the fight. Um, and uh, I am happy to help and assist uh, that activism in any way, shape, or form I can. It's what I love to do the most. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I am, I have, I just want to close by saying actually that. Um, the only solace in all of this is that we have people like Peter Tabins and Marit Stiles fighting for us in the legislature, holding this government's feet to the fire uh, on these really, really important critical issues. And I look forward to the day when there is a vaccine and when we can continue channel all of this energy and all this momentum and all these people that have connected with each other to fight for the, the repairs to funding public education in Ontario that we really need to have. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Um, I couldn't have said it better than the two panelists have said, so I won't repeat uh, their commentary. A few things. If you have not had a question answered uh, and you want to have it answered, send me an email, tabinsp co at ndp.on.ca. Uh, we are saving the thread of the questions and answers and we'll try and get back to people where we have identification for an email. Um, I want to thank my staff, Susan, Elaine, Rob, who have, I have to say, worked extraordinarily hard to make all this happen. It was very, very good of them, and I really appreciate it. Uh, yes, exactly. Um, to my two panelists, Mart and Jennifer, thanks for agreeing to be part of this this evening. Uh, it was invaluable, totally invaluable. And to all of you who attended this evening and who filled out the survey, thanks so much. Uh, as Jennifer said, I think, Mart, you've had the same experience in the West End. You've got a highly committed group of parents, a uh, highly committed group of people in the community who want to make sure that the right thing happens uh, in our schools. Good night, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, and by the way, this is going to be posted. Uh, it's been recorded. So if you want to relive it, you're going to have the opportunity. Have a good night.